Three weeks remain in the season, and tonight's Seminole Northeast matchup has playoff implications. Sam Roper's Warhawks are unbeaten, and in three straight games against the Vikings, Jerry Austin's team has only managed one touchdown. Tonight, Josh Harris leads the knee-high air attack against Joey Fabrizio's fun and run offense. It's high school football, Warhawks and Vikings next on the Game of the Week. John Sexton Field in St. Petersburg. TWTV 47 presents the game of the week tonight. The championship of 5A District 8 is on the line as the Seminole Warhawks visit the Northeast. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Keaton, and welcome once again to high school football. It is week number eight, and once again, we have a championship. Two pass out here on TWTV 47, Northeast and Seminole. Let's bring in my broadcast partner. He's Sandy Penner from 620 WDAE, the sports animal. And Sandy, what else could we ask for in this game? We have a championship to hand out, great coaches, great players on the field, and finally some good records to look at, too. Yeah, forget about Notre Dame and Florida State. Here's the game tonight. <laughs> the last two years, Seminole and Northeast, Northeast has not scored a point. They've been shut out two straight games. They look to score tonight. They're going to have to score to win. Let's talk about the Seminole Warhawks. They come in unbeaten, ranked nine in the state of Florida in Class 5A. Last week they took care of the Warriors, and they have one of the better players in the county, maybe the Pinellas County Player of the Year. You've seen him here since he was a sophomore, Joey Fabrizio. Yeah, Joey Fabrizio playing both ways. And offensively, what Seminole's going to look to do is just run off tackle, run off tackle. I and mean, you think they've run off tackle enough? Run off tackle some more. They're big up front for the Seminole Warhawks on the offensive line and on the defensive line. The anchor of the defensive line is Ray Pike, probably has the play of the year when he returned a blocked field goal against East Lake to wrap up that game. This kid's big and he looks to make plays tonight. Yeah, looking to make plays against that Northeast offense. I would expect Northeast tonight we'll see is a you know a mixture of run and pass. They run the wing tee. I think they're going to like to throw the ball. Obviously, if they get behind, they're going to have to. Well, Sandy, you mentioned that Northeast has had some scoring problems the last couple of seasons, even going back to the last time they beat Seminole in 1999. That was only by a score of 7-6. to six. They come in tonight with the top-ranked offense. They have only one loss on the season, and they have one of the better quarterbacks, maybe the player of the year as well, Josh Harris. Yeah, Josh Harris, very solid. Uh, again, doesn't make mistakes. And Northeast against Boca Ciega, eight turnovers. They, I don't know, looking past them possibly, got beaten that game. They only have themselves to blame if they don't win the district championship. Running back and a defensive back, another outstanding player, Dom Dominique Flower, you've seen him here on the Game of the Week since he was a sophomore as well. Just outstanding talent. He'll get the ball a lot tonight as well. Maybe in the defensive secondary, he inches up to the line of scrimmage to stop that Fabrizio run. Yeah, I said to you before the game, you wonder how these guys would be if they didn't have to play offense and defense. Flower would be one of those guys that if he was playing one or the other, probably be a lot better. But he's a playmaker, and he's a guy they rely on to make big plays for them. And they're going to need big plays tonight. I don't think they're going to be able to grind it out against them tonight. They're going to need big plays to hit a couple big plays and take the lead. That's going to be the key. As Keith Jackson would say, this one's going to be a dandy. Come on back with us. TWTV 47 style high school football game of the week. Warhawks Vikings next. It's high school football here on TWTV 47. Eric Keaton, Sandy Penner, and later will be joined by Tampa Bay Buccaneer cheerleader Kimberly Kalinske. Let's go down to the 50-yard line where referee Jerry Hicks has the team captains from Seminole and Northeast for the coin toss. Number 
All right, so Seminole wins the coin toss, and they have deferred. And the Seminole Warhawks unbeaten at 7-0 in Class 5A, and possibly Class 5A, the toughest classification this season in the state of Florida. Jerry Hicks is joined by Dick McCreary, Rick Cecil, Ryan McCreary, and Will Colon is the back judge. Warhawks undefeated in the district, still have one more game, but this contest tonight, Sandy, is considered the district championship, much like last week's game between CCC and St. Pete Catholic. The Warhawks obviously confident tonight against the Northeast Vikings. They have defeated them two years in a row handedly, and even the game that they lost in 1999 was a 7-6 score in which they lost a on the field goal attempt at the end of the game, had a chance to win that one. But walking up the stands, a lot of Northeast Viking fans telling us they're going to get theirs tonight, Sandy. Yeah, three touchdowns. You might want to start with one touchdown before you get three touchdowns. The last two years, this game has been marked by just a physical domination by Seminole. They've been able to run the ball. They've been able to basically pound Northeast. And then, obviously, Northeast is, uh, you know, last year's game was close for a while into the fourth quarter. But as far as actually physically winning the battles of the line of scrimmage, which you know is what I check on each game, Seminole has done that the last two years, and we talked to uh, talked to their coaches before the game, and they said, nothing's changed. It's going to be the same things. what we're going to try and do, and we're not fancy. We're not going to do anything crazy. We're just going to do what we do best, and that's just uh, line up and physically pound you. The coaches for tonight's contest. On the right, Jerry Austin, 24th season, 176 wins and only 79 losses, and to the left is Sam Roper, 18 seasons, and don't let the record fool you, 86 and 98. But Sandy, within the last Four seasons, including 1998, 43 and 11. Yeah, and this is a great coaching matchup. You got two. Uh... Let's pause for the pledge. Excuse me, the national anthem. First nothing, national like a, nothing like a sneak national anthem. <laughs> Bam, there it is. Well, the Warhawks are on their side of the field, and the Northeast Vikings are ready to get fired back up after having to put on their helmets. And I think it caught them a little bit off guard as well. Here's the 5A District 8. What's at stake tonight? We have the two top teams here. The only loss for Northeast, that to Poca Siega. And so if the Northeast Vikings win tonight, they will claim the district title. All of their district games will be finished. Seminole still has one more, but even if they would win this game and lose next week, they would be the district champion. Morgan Riley is set to kick off for the Seminole Warhawks. Very good leg. Morgan ended the kick last year against Manatee in the playoffs. Yeah, made field goals from 44 and 47 this year. Watching them before the game kicking uh, kicking 50 yarders. You know, that's a, that's a pretty long field goal. He was kicking them, kicking them with ease. Some of them look a lot better than others. Some of them were, you know, a little wobbly, but still 50 yard field goals and could play a big part tonight. It'd be interesting to see uh, if Seminole can impose their will, Eric, like they've done the last couple of years in Northeast and really just uh, run the football and you know, get into those second and shorts as opposed to and then Northeast obviously is going to try and make us into a game where they can force, force Seminole out of their comfort zones. Sherman Clemens and Sammy Edwards standing near their goal line for Northeast as the Vikings spirit team, the cheerleaders, they're ready for this game. And we have 12 minutes on the clock and Morgan Riley is just waiting to hear from Jerry Hicks so we can get this 5A District 8 championship game underway here at John Sexton Field. And it should be a good one. 
Smith. Riley sending this one about eight yards deep into the end zone, and there he shows you his footwork right off the bat. And so the Northeast Viking offense, they haven't shown much offense the last two seasons, even the last three games against that Seminole defense. Josh Harris is the quarterback, the younger brother of Andrew Harris at UCF. And Harris in his second season starting six interceptions on the season, but five of those thrown in one game and 13 touchdown passes, a very good completion rate as well. And already nearing his yard total of 1,400 last season, a little more than 1,100 this year. We'll get to the rest of that starting lineup after the first play from the 20-yard line for Northeast. And they'll pitch it. This one going to Fields, and Fields, good yardage across the 25 to the 26-yard line. It'll bring up a second down and four. And here is that offense. Jeremy Frederick is the fullback. Flowers, the running back, along with Fields, who just got that last carry. Pretty good receiving tandem in the tight end, Ross and Poole. Up front, they're not that big, but the tackle, the left tackle and the right tackle is Dolphin Messer, Rojas Richards, and Hodge. Hodge is just huge at 6'5", 313, and only a junior. Second down and four. Moving on the left side, and a flag will come out. Looked like Ray Pike had some movement at that left defensive end position, and Sandy, we've been saying all year, as soon as you make the movement come across, unlike in the pros in college, you can get back across the line of scrimmage, but in high school, it's an automatic five and a first down. The defense, there's Ray Pike, Darren Kay, Raphael Wallace, and Jeff Weichel. Not as big as they used to be in the past, and the linebacking core, it's a good one with Joey Fabrizio, Akamovsky, Gaucher, Riley Hicks, Langs, and Ciano in the secondary. That secondary missing Ryan McNally, who played at some linebacker and safety spot last season. It's a first down at the 31 for Northeast after the penalty. The inside counter goes to Flower. Flower gets up to the 36-yard line. Looks like he'll have a gain of five, second down and five. And this is what Northeast wants to do. Interesting little play there was a... Uh you don't see this that off, a little handoff and then a then a quick a little pitch and then a handoff through to the running back. It's funny talking to Coach Roper before the game. He said, oh, you know, they might throw a halfback pass here or there. You know, nothing to really we haven't seen before. Well, that's something I haven't seen before. Welcome to the Northeast offense. Yeah, that's what Coach Austin likes to do, Sandy. He'll have those inside traps or inside counters. Harris, little play action, looking to put the football in the air. Now he'll run it. He's a dangerous runner as well just looking to get back to the line of scrimmage and he didn't make it and a late flag comes in and Flowers saying this is going to be against Seminole. Harris might have lost two yards on the play but let's see what the flag. And they'll gain some yardage with that face mask. A little variation on the freeze option which actually uh, was run very successfully at Syracuse by Donovan McNabia. Freeze the linebackers, our freeze the safeties uh, and then you've bought yourself some extra time back in the pocket. Nobody open, but it's uh, it's a good way, and what it's a good way to set people up and set people up for the deep pass. Just be a five-yard face mask, bring up a second down and short for Northeast. Call it a second down and a two. Just underway here, first quarter action here at Northeast High School, the 5A District 8 Championship, Seminole in white and green, and in big red, Pinellas County style. Northeast Vikings, this is Fields, and he'll keep those feet moving and legs churning across the 41-yard line, and he'll pick up the first down to the 43. So Northeast controlling the clock here. I'm a big fan of the, the numbers on the helmets. I don't know if you like that. I've always liked that. Alabama. Alabama, yeah. I just think it's a cool thing. You got the number of the helmet, and I don't know. Not that many teams do it anymore. It's a good look. Harris, a leader of this offense. He was one of our top five players that we talked about at the beginning of the season for the high school scoreboard. He, along with Fabrizio on the other side, Fabrizio playing that middle linebacker position. We'll keep an eye on him taking over from where Dequel Jackson left off last year. Reverse coming this way. This is Flower, and he's chased down by number four, Fabrizio. Looked like Flower had some room, but Fabrizio catches up to him and only lets him gain about a couple yards. Great closing speed there for Brizio. Akamovsky in there as well. Uh, really shut this play down. As this play starts, it looks like it's got something. Looks like a little bit of a seam, and there come, uh, comes Fabrizio, and Sayano in on the play as well. 
And Siano the space. works off a block, and he's able to get a piece of the ball carrier. Fabrizio leading Seminole in tackles. Top rusher in Pinellas County, and again, as you said, Sandy, at the beginning, it's too bad some of these guys have to play on both sides of the football because they would really excel on just one side. The second down and eight, the 45-yard line. The pitch going to Fields. Fields had a running lane, but guess who's there? It's Joey Fabrizio along with number 32, Ty Hicks. Well, Fabrizio is special. I mean, here's a guy that's getting a, getting a million carries and expected to be carried the load offensively, yet he's playing middle linebacker. He's barking out signals. He's making tackles. There he is with the big play. Just always seems to be around the ball. And you, you know, Eric, that's something I know it's a cliche you can't teach. It's having a nose for the football. Six foot, 205 pound Joey Fabrizio. I mean, you had to quote Jackson, he was doing the same. He was playing quarterback and playing middle linebacker for the Seminole Warhawks. Third down near midfield and three. Harris looking to put it in the air. And the rush is on and Fabrizio takes him down. That'll be a loss of 13 yards. Everywhere early in the game, Joey Fabrizio. And this is just a, a little bit of a missed assignment here. I think we're on the offensive line. It might have been a, it might have been attempting possible to set up something short, suck the offensive line in, but Fabrizio just everywhere. Kelly DeWitt with the punt. Ciano standing at the 20-yard line, trying to evade a northeast tackler, gets to the outside. He evaded a couple of them, headed down the sidelines, and he'll be taken out at the 35-yard line by number 13, DeAndre Poole, but that's a 15-yard gain for Ciano. And Seminole's offense, with Greg Ware, the quarterback, will start out on their own 35. Nifty piece of running here, Sandy. He evaded a couple of gunners down there for northeast. Yeah, and had a seam up the sideline. Here it's nice. Make it something out of nothing. Almost in a weird way, almost, and this happens a lot more in the NFL. Does in college, you outkick the coverage a little bit. Coverage gets down the field too quickly. You're able to make a play. Where are the quarterback? They don't throw it often for Seminole. They love to run it. And movement on the right side. As it looked like the right tackle for Seminole move, and they'll move back five yards and create a first and 15 for the Seminole Warhawk offense. Led by Greg Ware, the quarterback, and then it's Joey Fabrizio, Gaucher, and Zanol, the running backs. Aguia and Ree, the tight end and wide receiver. They don't get much action. Up front, they are big, and they are led by Lauren Zetti, number 63. And then it's Blackledge, Sand, Dadswell, Ford. You throw in Aguia the tight end and they average about 240. This is Fabrizio trying to get to the left side. Not much room hit head on by Dominique Flower. And Dominique Flower there motioning no gain on that play and here's the rest of his teammates on that Viking defense. Big Red, Frederick Evans Gamble. The smaller Gamble is Joey and then Ryan Ross. He goes both ways as well as a tight end and defensive end. They play five men up front. Defensive ends act as outside linebackers. Then it's Hare, Fields, Edwards, Flower, Poole, Jerron Green not in. Harris will get a start at safety. Straight up the middle, this is Gauthier. Gauthier has the first down. He's at midfield. A huge hole for Ryan Gauthier as he picks up about 18. I think they're concentrating on Fabrizio just a little bit. You know, six guys staring right at him. Gauthier gets the carry here. It's good offensive line work again. And I think what's going to be important to watch Northeast in this game is they're going to really need our flow to the ball. What I mean by that is don't meet Seminole at the point of contact right after you take your first uh, step. You almost want to take your first step to the side and flow to the ball a little bit. Because if Seminole gets contact right off the snap, uh, Northeast is going to have problems. Lone receiver. Top side of the screen, right at the 50-yard line. This is Gaucher again. Will not get much. He'll fall forward for about two. Fields, one of the many Northeast Vikings there, along with uh, Corinthian Thompson as well. And that's what I mean. And they, they did a good job there. That's what I mean by flowing the ball, kind of funneling the running back back towards more help. See it happen. Same same concept, uh, same principle, Eric, as in basketball. You try and funnel someone towards a shot blocker. You basically want to fumble for Breeze, uh, funnel Fabrizio or Gaucher, who's ever carrying the ball back towards where you can get some help, and then you've got the rest of your team are kind of flowing from the opposite side of the field to the ball. We have a timeout on the field. We'll take a break along with Seminole Northeast. 5.50 remaining in the first quarter. No score.
second down and eight for Seminole. Their first possession of the ball game. Northeast had their first possession in near midfield when they had a short third down conversion to make. And then Joey Fabrizio sacked Josh Harris for about a 13-yard loss and had to punt it away. Seminole took over on this drive from their own 35-yard line and used a Ryan Gauthier 18-yard run to get to midfield. So we have a second down and eight here at the 5A District 8 Championship. Memories of last year's game in which Seminole went on a, you don't see this in any level, a 12-play, 12 yard, a 12 play 93 yard drive takes up 11 minutes. You want to talk about deflating. If Seminole put a couple of those drives together tonight against Northeast, and that's deflating or for defense, to have them just hit you, hit you, hit you. You know, you get a couple of first downs, and, and all of a sudden you're at midfield, and then you drive the rest of the field, you get a touchdown. It's uh, just uh, debilitating to a defense. Especially in high school football when you have maybe half your team going both ways and it happens in the second half, in particular in midway through the fourth quarter, you're just going to be beat down and it's hard to recover from that. And at that time it was after the extra point a 10 point lead, but it was ball game, ball game over. And, you know, in Northeast today, you know, obviously you would think that when talking about trying to corral Fabrizio, they want to make sure they you know, get shots in on him, legal shots obviously, make sure he gang tackle, make sure he feels the tackles because this kid's got to come out and play middle linebacker on the other side of the ball. Not sure what our timeout on the field is for, but Greg Ware is going to wander over to the far sideline to get the play again, maybe give us a chance to introduce Kimberly Kalinske. We haven't had uh, our sideline report. Last week we had Scott Epstein and he filled in. Admirably. Yes. Right yes. And we'll get to her right after this next play as Greg Ware comes over. And we'll finally get to back to action here. Seminole operating a second down and eight on the northeast 48-yard line, right at midfield. Set it back in motion. Ware looking to throw it. Ware is just trying to escape. And he will not do it. He goes down at the 45-yard line. He'll lose seven on the play. Again, Thompson in on that tackle. Had some help from Ryan Ross. Let's go down to Kimberly Kalinske where she's talking 98.7. At the moment, we are searching for the wild 98.7 fan of the game. We're in search of the person with the most school spirit, school colors, and enthusiasm. In the fourth quarter, we're going to announce that winner of the game. They'll receive a prize pack consisting of hats, T-shirts, so many fun things. So I encourage everybody to show their school spirit in hopes to be the wild 98.7 fan of the game. All right, thanks a lot, Kim. Third down, 15 for Seminole. They put the football in the air, at least try to. They'll have to do it again here on successive play and this one was almost intercepted and right into the hands of Sammy Edwards off the intended receiver, number 85, Kyle Reed. And making the read was Edwards. He would have been gone, Sammy. Usually when you're not a passing team like Seminole obviously isn't, these last two plays are what happens when you're not a passing team and you try to pass. Usually it does not work out too well. And the last two plays, the, the second down play was a disaster. And that play obviously was going nowhere. And Seminole can't put themselves in position like that. Edwards and Flower will move back and stand at their 10-yard line. Morgan Riley is the punter. High, but it's a short kick that's going to drop it around the 20 and take a nice Seminole Warhawk bounce deep inside. Northeast Territory, they'll down it all the way at the 4-yard line. That is a kick of 51 yards. We'll take a break. Northeast coming up with their second possession. High School Football Game of the Week. Eric Keaton, Sandy Penner, and Kimberly Kalinske. And just because we're not at your high school on a Friday night for the Game of the Week, we do have the high school scoreboard. About three, maybe four crews out of games on Friday nights. This week, we're in Pinellas, Manatee, and Hillsborough County. Just join us on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. This week, we have our Halloween edition. It's going to be a lot of fun. Northeast from their own four-yard line, running this way. And would have had a lot more yards. I believe that's Ernest Fields. Actually, it's Flower. Flower got to the eight-yard line. Flower had a whole sideline to pick and choose from, but he seemed to be bitten by the turf monster here. 
Watch out for that turf monster. What's the Halloween edition all about? Is it like, ooh, you know, the girls, uh, the host, the girls uh, from Riverview and Tampa Catholic, Allie Peak and Kirsten Burris were uh, dressing up in their, uh, their own Halloween outfits that they picked. Nothing too scary. The uh, great Paul King with all of his Halloween uh, goodies uh, dressed, dressed up the set. Paul King? Yeah, Paul King. Owes me money. He's the ghoul in the show. Be a lot of fun. Second down coming up for Northeast. Harris trying to escape the end zone. Will he run it or will he throw it? Has a lot of time. Going to throw in the run. Looking deep, but this one will be out of play. And both times Northeast has tried to throw the football. You've had Harris on the run, either by design or that Seminole defense just coming after him. Not that I'm trying to nitpick because I don't like to do that, but Jeremy Federick was really, I guess for lack of a better term, wide open on this play. They're rolling out, obviously, Harris is, makes a smart play to get rid of the ball, but I don't know if we'll get a shot of it in the middle of the field. Federick's wide open. Uh, I don't think we get a shot of it, but obviously went in trouble there. Smart play, get rid of it. What do you want your quarterback to do? So third down and six coming up for Northeast on their own eight-yard line is Harris uh, trying to complete a pass tonight. Clock stopped at 3.33. Seminole needing a stop here so they can win the field position game here early. Harris will run it. This is Flower near sideline. Flower gets out of bounds at the 15. They'll mark him out at the 17-yard line. He will have the first down. He needed to get to the 14. So move the chains for the Northeast Vikings. Good job by Ryan Richards here. Doesn't again, he doesn't knock anyone down, just gets out. As you can see, pulls out. Got Ryan Richards out there. You got David Messer out there. And just getting in the way, people. Eric, we've talked about it since we started the broadcast. Doesn't always have to be an eye-opening block. Just getting out there and obstructing the ability of the, of the defensive player to make a play. Flowers starting to build his numbers. Four carries and 20 yards. So a little bit more breathing room for the Northeast Vikings from their own 17-yard line. Did they start it out on their own four? This will be Harris straight up the middle. It is the ball carrier, not much there. That may be picked up about three, four yards, and that's all. Offensive line of uh, Northeast does a lot of, uh, and you'll see it in, in, with, the, with the traps and the draws that they like to run and the counters. Do a lot of uh, pulling out. What I mean by that is the, is the right guard, or the, usually the right guard will come all the way across the other side of the field to help out with the blocking. And um, It's something that takes getting used to as a defense. Obviously, Seminole has seen it before playing Northeast, but um, throughout the course of a game, Seminole's defense can have to adjust to that. Frederick picks up four to second down and six for Harris. Gaucher showing the blitz on the outside, does not get there. Again, near the 25-yard line, they'll mark it at the 24 to bring up a third down and three for Northeast. And Sherman Clemens getting some work now as Coach Austin rotating guys in and out, trying to get some people some touches so his team doesn't get worn down. I'll tell you what, that center, Fernando Rojas, standing next to the quarterback. He isn't the biggest center, but he's getting the job done. Third down and three from the 24. Harris, this is Flower. Flower trying to gain the first down, and he will in the exact same carry he had to pick up the first down to continue this drive. He's out across the 35 to the 36. He'll gain 12. Everyone out there for Northeast, I talked about pulling out. Again, you'll see Richards out there, Messer. It even often gets down the field a little bit. There's Richards, number 54, gets knocked over, but still impedes the progress. Good job by the offensive line to get out and get in the way of someone. And just I'm very impressed so far with Northeast offensive line, what they will do with, with the... Uh, with the front seven of Seminole. Ray Pike made that tackle, but when you're a defensive lineman making him 12 yards downfield, uh, that's not the kind of tackles your defensive coordinator wants you to make in Mike Perlin. Flower again goes in motion, straight up the middle. Fabrizio had some help. He wasn't there on the initial contact against Frederick, but he was there to clean up the rest. That may be a loss of a yard on the play. Yard loss, second down, 11 called getting stuck. And I don't mean like, you know, your shirt getting stuck in your zipper. Yeah. I'm talking about getting stuck. When you come Darren Kay, he's the one that stuck him. 
He's the one that tripped him. And then Fabrizio came in and finished the job. That's what your defensive linemen do. You know, the defensive linemen, they'll sometimes create, you know, misdirect the runner to go the other way, but they don't get the tackle, but they're still doing their job. Ninth play of this drive. Harris going to put it in the air. Rush is on. This pass is complete. The pull pulls across the 40 to the 41 yard line. He's knocked out by number eight, Anthony Ciano. It'll bring up a third down and six for the Vikings. Seminole here just trying to keep everything in front of them on second and, and very long. That play is there for Northeast if they want it. Underneath, underneath, underneath. Like Seminole showing some respect for some of the Northeast speed on the outside, the receivers. And you set that up enough, Eric, set it up, set it up, set it up. What do we talk about all year long? You be able to hit a play deep. Bang. Bang. Bada boom, bada bing. First completion of the night for Northeast. First completion of the ball game. Less than 35 seconds playing the first quarter on the third and six. Little hand play action by Harris. Harris will be rushed and Harris will be dropped. No, he stays on his feet. He's not going to get the first down. He might have got back to the line of scrimmage. But he was being harassed and he wasn't. Able to go down as Raphael Wallace thought he had him, but he still did enough damage to prevent Northeast from picking up a first down. And they stopped the clock now with 17 seconds left as we have a hurt Northeast Viking around midfield. Watch Harris here stay on his feet, Sandy. Reminiscent of a Randall Cunningham play Monday Night Football circa, I think it was 1988 against the Giants, you remember? Goes down on one leg. Holds himself up with one arm, throws a touchdown pass to, I believe it was former Buck Jimmy Giles, if my memory <laughs> serves me correctly. And I have a pretty good memory for some things. It was Kay eventually caught up to him. He'll get credit for the uh, sack on the play. It's a fourth down and eight coming up. And we're going to take a timeout and tend to this Viking that is injured at midfield. We'll be back right after this. Fields, who was shook up on that play, and he's back up. And it's a good sign for the Vikings that he's walking off under his own power. DeWitt again back to punt for the Northeast Vikings. Could be the final play of the first quarter. We have no score. Seminole set to start the second quarter with their second possession of the game. A low snap, DeWitt handles it. Going back, this is Ciano. Ciano thought about calling for the fair catch, but he had to dive forward and catches it at about the 32 as time expires here in the first quarter of play. We played 12 minutes, and each team between them have had three possessions of the game. We'll switch sides. And Seminole will start out at their own 32-yard line. Coach Austin, I was talking, Sandy, at your radio show this morning uh, where I join you every Friday at 7 o'clock. Coach Austin's team from 95 to 99, they made the playoffs. They had the 45-game regular season win streak. 2000, they had a down season. And from that moment on, Coach Roper's Warhawks have taken over. It's kind of like the team of the 90s tonight against the team of the new millennium. But I, won't, I don't want to give the Warhawks that much credit because millennium is a long time instead of giving them a decade. You know what I'm saying? So it's just hard saying the team of the early 2000s, I guess you could say. Yeah, and it's a great coaching matchup between uh, two old and, you know, this is a complimentary term, two old war horses, guys that have been around the block. And I think all you need to see about Jerry Austin is uh, the picture of him up in the press box. You can yeah. see up there, the boss. Yeah. The boss. New nice press box. box here. Yes, nice. Air conditioned. Yeah. Beautiful. The old one, I was talking with uh, Bob Myers, who's the PA voice here. He's been here for like 27 years. And I said, boy, new press box, new this. And he's like, Eric, you guys haven't been here in three years. Of course, it's new. You guys have just caught our games on the road. Nice digs. Nice scoreboard. At the 32-yard line. Seminole will have their second possession. And this game's starting out, Sandy, much like last year's. Each team grinding out, working between the 20s, field, 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 field position. Yeah, exactly. Kind of get the feel of each other. It was three to nothing for a long time in that game. And second possession. New quarterback in for Seminole. It's Bernard Coleman. And he'll just hand it off, and it goes for about a three-yard gain for Brizio. Getting the carry, bring up a second down. Oh, that will give him two yards. He's got near the 34-yard line. It'll be a second down and eight for Seminole. 
think both teams just getting comfortable. That's what the other team does. We knew it was going to be a physical game, a lot of hitting, low scoring. Coleman, the quarterback, will give it to Gauthier. Gauthier will slip and fall and just pick up a yard. Tried to make a cut, couldn't do it. Tommy Herr had his running lane shut down, and he'll get credit for the tackle. It's amazing that Tommy Hart could play that long in the major leagues and still now be able to come back and play and high school football. Even to get and to qualify to go back to high school. Yeah, it's weird. I guess you know? he didn't finish, you know, finish all his classes when he was playing baseball. It's, uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and Anthony McFarlane He's in high school on well. the roster tonight. Not getting uh, some playing time that I've seen thus far because they're going to save him for Sunday. I wonder if they've given this Anthony McFarlane like uh, another nickname, you know, like the Booger. Maybe they gave him Little Booger or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just good. Er. It's a third down and long. Loose football, and Como will just have to fall on it. And he'll lose a couple yards back close to the original line of scrimmage. He'll fall on it at the 33, so a three and out for the Seminole Warhawks. And then, again, this is just a case where you're going to shift quarterbacks back and forth. There's a different cadence. There's a different count. You know, there's different, uh, it may sound stupid, there's different hands that are underneath getting the... Coach Roper was talking about the, the one of the problems they had uh, earlier. And, oh, and stepping across, it'll give him five yards. Corinthian Thompson looked like he was ready to come on a blitz up the middle, maybe block the punt by Morgan Riley, but this will be a five-yard penalty. Will not be enough for a Seminole first down, but they'll take it. If anyone were to ask me why I don't coach, and I would write an, write an essay or something, That'd be what the essay will be about. Plays like that. Flower and Edwards. Edwards moves up to the 30. Flower standing at his own 20-yard line, the Northeast returnman. Riley will punt it away. From the 39 and taking it at his 20 will be Flower. Flower heading to the near side. Flower has an outside running lane, decides to go back up the middle, and he'll be shut down after 11-yard return. We'll take a break here on the game of the week. Both teams still trying to feel each other out. 9.48 left in the first half. Welcome back to the game of the week. Eric Keaton, Sandy Penner, Kimberly Kalinske. 9.48 left in the first half. Harris and his Vikings from their 31-yard line, starting their third possession. And running this way will be number 20 is Sherman Clemens. Clemens doesn't get much. Might have got back to the line of scrimmage, and that is it. Joey Fabrizio. One day, we could be talking about him on the College Crossfire. We'll not be talking about anybody on College Crossfire this Tuesday, but we'll be back on Election Day. We have an education forum this coming Tuesday, October 29th, but we'll be back on Election Day, November 5th. Of course, we'll be talking about FSU, Notre Dame. We'll still talk about it, even though it's a week old. Here's a good game. We should pick on that one, Sandy. What did we pick last week? Uh, we picked pros. I think I lost. Eagles and Bucks. Yeah, we're tied now at 2-2. Okay. So we'll... Notre Dame and Florida State will be the tiebreaker. Harris, new ball carrier. Jerron Green, Jerron Green might have picked up a yard, and that is it. Gauthier is in on that tackle for the Seminole Warhawks. He had some help as well. well I'm going to let you pick because, I, I, you know, it's a 10-point line in that game. Uh, you know, I'm going to let you make the pick, and I'll just take the other side. Well, I have to stick with the same pick that I had on the college crossfire with John Reeves and Casey Weldon. I'm sticking with the Irish. Okay, you like the Irish to win the game? Like the Irish to win the game. All right. I, I think it's going to be a close game. I think Florida State is going to uh, find the Notre Dame's defense a lot better than they think. Fairly low scoring. Uh, I think it'll be tough for Notre Dame to win there, uh, just especially with that offense. But what's up? But I've got Florida State. We'll see what happens. Clock just ticking away here at this game, and now a flag comes out from the back judge. Possibly too much time for the Northeast Vikings. They had a third down and nine, and now it'll be a third down and 15. A definite passing situation for Josh Harris and Coach Austin. You know, when you talk about Coach Austin, when I first started doing high school football here, you know, they, they say in the pro level that Coach Gruden was one of the best play callers in the National Football League. And they said with Coach Austin, that's on Friday nights, he would just shine. He knows what play to call to a T. See if he can call one here on the third down and 14. Harris, going to put it up. 
and he'll just go down. He, he hasn't had time to run at all. He's always been flushed out of the pocket. I don't know if that's by design, Sandy, but here he takes himself out, and I'm not sure if, if it's maybe a wet field because they, they were sprinkling the field maybe 30, 40 minutes before the team started yeah, warming up. Looks like he slipped here, just lost his footing. That's a design rollout. I think you mentioned the play calling, and I, it's interesting. He's play calling. Many people, I'll, I'll make I'll make a point after the punt about play calling and, and uh, kind of the misconception about exactly what it is. I want to clarify that when I said they were sprinkling the field, it was by accident. Great kick by DeWitt. Will take a Northeast Viking bounce all the way inside the 20-yard line. And they'll down it at the 16 from the 18 to the 16. That's a punt of 66 yards with the roll. Uh, yards on the kick with no return. One of my drives in golf, you know, 100 yards off the tee, hit the cart path, <laughs> hit the cart girl, hit a tree. So special teams coming into play here as Ciano decides to watch it roll. I don't think he would have been able to run over there and catch it anyway. Great directional punt by DeWitt. Yeah, you got to make that play, though, if you're... Uh you know, if you're saying, you got to make that play, you got to make that catch on where you're Even if you're just going out of bounds, you can't allow that ball to roll. So Seminole starts out from the 16-yard line. We have no score approaching the midway point of the second quarter. Greg Ware is back in at quarterback. It was three and out for his replacement, Bernard Coleman. Send a man in motion. This will be Gauthier at the middle, and he is wrapped up around the waist by Corinthian Thompson. Thompson uh, had a little ankle sting there, a little burner. A bit surprised by the lack of Joe Fabrizio in this offense. I think he might have, I don't remember anything except for that first carry. I don't know if he has another carry after that. Uh, I, I, again, you know, playing defense well. Well, maybe he'll be saved for the second half, but I would have thought a healthy, a healthy dose of him in the first half. Yeah, Fabrizio only a couple carries. Maybe they're saving him for the second because they're relying on him for defense. Right, we'll give this one again to Gauthier. Gauthier, far side. We'll get to the 24-yard line. It'll be about three yards shy of the first down for Seminole. So a very makeable third down situation coming up for the Warhawks. You mentioned play calling before, and, and Jerry Austin, his reputation proceeds as far as play calling goes. And play calling is having the nerve to call a play and really not have it work for you. Your play calling is really about knowing and guessing and getting some wrong from time to time. It's about being creative, and it's about knowing uh, what the strength of your football team is, and that's why he's been so good at it over the years. They're down in a long two for Seminole. Loose football again on the snap. It happened to Coleman on the last possession, and it happens to wear here, so a, a play goes awry. The second fumbled snap. And it'll bring up a fourth down and two. And Coach Roper was mentioning this to us in the pregame. They've had some problems. We've got a couple of those. We're very, uh, very sloppy game so far for teams this good. It's a loss of a yard on the play. So Riley back in to punt it away. And it's Flower and Edwards ready to take the kick. Flower calling for the fair catch. And he raised his hand, and there's the whistle. I thought they were going to let him have a freebie. He caught it at the 42, and then a flag comes out. I don't know if it's maybe a fake fair catch, which can be called a penalty. It's always, always a weird call when they do make it. Well, I thought he would clearly signal the fair catch, but immediately that whistle has to come out. If you don't hear the whistle, the first reaction from a player is going to be to run. It's obviously a call for a fair catch there. Yeah, and see, he stops. He's ready. He's pulling up. No whistle. Why stand around and get hit? I'm wondering, Eric, if that is the call, because if it is, yeah. you're right about it. You know, you don't blow the whistle. You're supposed to keep running. You're not trying to show anyone up. Five-yard walk-off. Hey, well, we don't hear from the official tonight. I'm not sure if we have them mic'd. Or at least we couldn't hear it up here. Heard our PA guy here say violation of the fair catch. Okay, which so would that's, mean that's I what would, you had. Would mean, yeah, it would mean a fake fair catch, which is always a call that I've never really yeah, understood just, why it's even in there. Just my opinion, the, the whistle did not come out, so I wouldn't stand around and want to get hit. To the 36-yard line. Coming this way, near side, it's Shimon Clemens, and Clemens gets a first down inside Seminole territory, an 18-yard gain to the 46-yard line. 
He brought up a good point, partner, about the field. Uh, I don't know if it's between maybe the 25s, because this was just an obvious slippage here in the middle of the field. It can't be everyone's wearing the wrong cleats and just, just falling down. Most of the watering. Harris, when I, when I mentioned it, they really weren't watering that side of the field. Most of it was from the 40-yard line to the end zone that Northeast is driving toward right now. But they get a big run from Clemens. And now it's a first down and 10 on the Seminole 46. He'll get it again. And just following his blockers and not an easy run, but he'll take the four yards. Hey, you know, I, I like the pitches and, and what, what, what Northeast likes to do with their offense here is instead of just handing the ball off, which a lot of times, Eric, a running back has got to slow up when you hand the ball off. He's got to get steps together. You've got to get a rhythm in order. You give the guy the pitch, he's got a little bit of, a, of, of time to really hit the line with speed. He's catching the ball while he's still moving instead of having to stand still and take the hand off. And, um, it works well, especially when you get your, your tackles pulling out there, create space. Fields and Clemens in the offset eye behind Harris. He'll give it back to Flower on the inside trap, and Flower will fall forward to the 40-yard line. He'll be about three yards shy of the first down. It'll bring up a third down and three for Northeast. A rapidly moving first half. I'm going to be, be home before my wife wants me to be home. What am I going to do about that? I have to sit out in the car outside? Just walk around was the she having like a, a party times. or something? Uh, the girls uh, are over? You know what? I don't even want to know what she's doing, but I know she doesn't want me there. So if I get home, you know, too much before a certain time, you know, I get in trouble. Flower, look, that. Flower looks like he's hurt. Seven carries and 34 yards for him. And it's third down and three. In the 40-yard line, northeast. A little pitch to Clemens. Clemens, flag comes out. He's close to the sticks, but a flag in that direction sometimes is a block below the waist or a block in the back. Or could it be a face mask? And if it is for Northeast, they'll definitely have the first down. But it is a hold against Northeast, so they'll have to try this one again. <coughs> I think obviously out there you see that that was uh, Ernest Fields with the hold. And... I'm not, again, it, it's very hard to tell a player, Eric, not to hold. But when he's six, seven yards away from the play, and the play's obviously turned the corner, he just, as a coach, hates to see that happen. Well, with the penalty and the run, it makes it a now a third down and 12 back to the Seminole 48-yard line. Northeast needs to get to the 36 for first down. So a passing situation for Harris against that Seminole defense. That Seminole defense last year number one in the county comes into this game. About average when you look at points given up and yards allowed, number 12 in the county. Harris will hand it off. This is Frederick. Frederick going to run for the first down. And he's still on his feet inside the 30 to the 27-yard line. A gain of 21 yards. It wasn't a passing situation. It was a Frederick situation. Not a passing situation. You can run the ball like that and get a first down, right? Play calling. Play calling the element of surprise. Did I mention that when I gave you my whole uh, soliloquy about... Hope you know what the word soliloquy means, by the way. Yes. Okay. Uh, did I say mention the element of surprise? It was in there. Okay. Good. It had to be in there. I'd like my thesis to be complete. First down for Northeast. Clemens on the short pass. Clemens goes down. Might have picked up a yard to the 26. They might give him credit for two. As he just kind of fell to the ground there at the feet of the Seminole defense. A scoring threat, our first real scoring threat of the ball game as we approach the two minute warning here. This game is flying by. Charter territory here for Northeast. They haven't scored the last two years against Seminole. Down in this, you know, down here inside the 30 yard line. They might not know what to do. The last time they won this game, they were celebrating a non-score by Seminole. As Seminole trailing seven to six late in the ball game, marched their field goal kicker out with about 10 seconds left in the game. And Seminole had a chance to end the Pinellas County record winning streak at that time. They missed a field goal. Coach Austin went about celebrating at midfield. One of the better uh, high school scoreboard shots that we've had as far as watching coaches celebrate. Next week, our district championship theme continues here on TWTV 47. And why not? Chamberlain at Hillsboro. We're back. 
the trilogy will be complete. After last year's four overtime game, the comeback by Chamberlain against Hillsborough in the playoffs, and that will be game number three. Of course, for Coach Roper or Co Coach Austin to meet one of those two teams in the playoffs, it would be in the state championship. They're in Region 2. This is Region 3. Once you start talking about the playoff pairings, of course, for Seminole, I was talking on your show this morning, Sandy, for them to remain undefeated if they win this game, they'd be the top seed in the playoffs, but that doesn't necessarily get game, give them home field throughout the entire playoff. Yeah, I was in the bathroom when you were talking about that. I just okay. turned my mic off. I was wondering. I was, getting, I was talking for a long period of time. I said, Greg, I'm not used to this. Harris, this is Flower back in the ball game. Cuts it back to the outside. Flower on his way to the end zone. Morgan Riley takes it down inside the 10 yard line down to the seven. It's a gain of 19. Flower looked like he was going to be dropped for a loss, but he broke it to the outside. Whatever was hurting on him, they fixed in a hurry. Take that baby up, put him back in the game, and get credit to the left side of the Northeast offensive line here for doing work, as you can see. Ryan Richards had a very good game, pulls out. It's a nice block on Fabrizio there. And that's just, that's just the way you draw up those plays. Get guards, get tackles out there, drive the guys near the out of bounds, mark the come back. Big play. First and goal for the Vikings. First and goal for Northeast. They'll pitch it again. Back to Clement. Clemens near the goal line. He's down at the one yard line. Make that Ernest Fields on the carry. Fields hasn't been given the ball. Clemens has been doing the work along with Flower, but he's got him on the goal line. Setting up a Harris quarterback sneak. The second down and goal, Sandy. Inside the one, approaching one minute left in the first half. Well, the play call that we talked about, but he's probably seen something more out of the here. Harris will pitch it back. Cut short of the goal line. They did not make it. That's an outstanding tackle. As it looked like Fabrizio and Akamovsky, I believe, got in underneath the ball carrier. And they'll have to stop and call a timeout here for Northeast. That was Frederick. I, I think Frederick got the ball and he didn't get in. The play by Akamovsky. There's penetration there and just coming off the left side. I mentioned something a little out of the ordinary, and that was not out of the ordinary here. Uh, wouldn't be a bad idea possibly to get Harris on the move a little bit see if he can roll out, maybe deliver a pitch. We've got 10, 11 guys up there in a, in a, in a you know, three-yard area up on the line. You've got to try and create some space, even if you have to send a couple of receivers out, Eric almost as decoys. Coach Perlin in with his crew. There's Jay Austin, the son of Jerry Austin. In with Northeast, Coach Perlin. I was telling you before, uh, beginning of the game, he's, seen, he's running the gamut there against uh, great quarterbacks as far as A.D. McPherson, Pat Carter, and Josh Harris. And he's had a great bunch of athletes to work with on that Seminole defense. And here's a challenge for him early. A third down and goal from the one yard line for Northeast trying to get in the end zone. 12 play, 59 yard drive right now that has consumed five minutes and they're trying to capitalize with six. Fields is in the backfield along with Frederick in the offset eye. They'll get it to Fields. Fields left side, touchdown Vikings. Why not run over the left side? You've been doing it the entire drive. Stick with what works. Basic little pitch. They've been running it the entire time. Quick cutback. Put a hat on a hat, like we like to say in football, and it's an easy six points. Whip will try the extra point. Flower is the holder. Snap, hold, kick is down, kick is good. The Northeast Vikings. It took them a couple years, but they're finally back on the scoreboard against Seminole. It counts. Fields a one-yard run. They did it with a 60-yard drive, more than five minutes off the clock. We have a score at 7 to nothing, Northeast.
Fields, the second leading ball carrier, number 30 for the Northeast Vikings, scoring his sixth touchdown of the season. It's a big one, Northeast, for the first time in the last two games. He's on the board, and they had the lead with 41 seconds left in the second quarter against their arch nemesis here in this district, the Seminole Warhawks. 13 plays and 60 yards on the drive, 5 minutes, 22 seconds. Perfect is that drive. You get it right at the end of the half. So maybe some little, you know, hopefully your defense holds them. They don't come down and score. Go in the locker room knowing that you won the physical battle in the first half. Big plays, runs by Clemens, and also Flower on that drive. Set it up. DeWitt to kick it off. Returnable kick by Siano at the 10-yard line. Siano hit and dropped at about the 25-yard line. So here we are, Sinny. Seminole takes the field with 35 seconds left. You have a non-passing team, maybe 40, 50 passes on the year between both quarterbacks. And with 35 seconds left, and you're putting in the, the backup quarterback, Bernard Coleman, who only has three snaps. One of them hit the ground that he had to fall on. Are you going to put the football in the air here? Are you just going to... It's not Take a couple style. of knees it's and not see style. if you get a big run, maybe. Maybe you see you get a big run on first down, then you make a decision about what you want to do. But you got to probably get this ball past midfield in the next two plays of any shot of scoring. And they haven't featured Fabrizio at all in the first half. The Seminole will get the ball to start the second half. The near side receiver. And we'll just hand it off straight up the middle. And this will be number 21, Anthony Catalano, the junior. And Catalano gets... Near the sticks, he's a couple yards shy, and it looks like that will be the final play, unless Seminole gets to the line of scrimmage to run another one. And it looks like they will with about 15 seconds left in the first half. Of course, if they get the first down, that will stop the clock. And now, there's a timeout. The officials can stop the clock. As Harris has an equipment adjustment and not, they're not getting crazy here. Just They're going to try and run the ball and go in with the idea that in the second half they'll continue with the switching quarterbacks, maybe give Fabrizio the ball a little bit more and see if they can wear down Northeast defense. Coleman, the quarterback. Give it again to Catalano. Catalano has the first down. He's across the 35 to the 37. And that will end the first half of play. Again, Fields, his sixth touchdown of the season. It's the only points we've had. It's one of the quickest, if not the quickest, first half we've had here. The Northeast will take it. They're ahead 7 to nothing. headed to the locker room. Come back with us for our halftime show. We'll recap the touchdown in the first half. And, of course, Kimberly will have both coaches on the sidelines to talk about their thoughts. We're back after this. And one of the quickest first halves you will find here on TWTV 47 or across the state of Florida on a Friday night. The Northeast Vikings have a 7-0 lead here on the game of the week. The 5A8 District Championship. I'm Eric Keaton. He's Sandy Pinner. Let's talk about the first half. And one of the highlights that we talked about at the beginning of the broadcast, you get to see two primetime players here in high school football. Joey Fabrizio, a linebacker, and the quarterback Josh Harris. Here they met early on. Yeah, Fabrizio just uh, basically running undaunted to the quarterback. And... That was early in the game when Northeast seemed to be a little bit off balance, what they were trying to do offensively. It looked like Seminole was going to have a drive going. Ryan Gaucher here on a long run for Seminole, but eventually it would just uh, stall out as Northeast would uh, toughen up. And uh, Harris making the tackle there, showing you that he's playing both ways. And then Northeast finally got the offense moving right in the second quarter. They had the ball for... Almost six minutes. Here's Clemens on a on a run, an 18-yard run. And watch at the tail end, Sandy. It's something that could be a, a play here in the second half. So a field looks a little slip. Yeah, it's looked a little wet. And almost in between, I want to say, the 25s. It's been a little wet. Harris lost his footing at least twice. There you saw that one. And uh, very solid drive by Northeast, though. Fields caps the 13 play, 60-yard drive, 5 minutes and 22 seconds. His sixth touchdown of the season, the first against the Seminole Warhawk defense since 1999. Northeast then left about 35 seconds for Seminole. They ran a couple plays, and that was it. Northeast has the lead, 7 to nothing, And you can see they've been doing it on the ground. Only one completed pass in this game. Seminole, though, as we heard from Coach Roper, they need to shore up the center to quarterback exchange. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to do much. And as you've been saying, get the ball to Fabrizio. Interesting. Uh, Kimberly talked to Coach Roper at halftime, and he said, well, we're going to spread the ball out a little bit. I'm not sure that that is necessarily working. And I, I think, the, obviously, the defense in Northeast, Eric, has geared up to stop Fabrizio. 
Fabrizio, but at the same time, they have not allowed, allowed other guys to really bust loose. I think we'll go in with the idea that Fabrizio will get, uh, what do you say, 10, 12 carries in the second half and see if he can just wear that defense down a little. He averages close to 20, so he needs about 15 to 18 more to keep up with that average. He is the Pinellas County's leading rusher. Find out if he'll get the ball in the second half. 7 to nothing. Vikings on top. Welcome back to High School Football here on TWTV 47. Eric Keaton and Sandy Penner with you. Northeast has a 7-0 lead. It's only one touchdown, but I'm pretty sure Jerry Austin is ecstatic when talking to Kimberly Kalinske. Coach Austin, your thoughts on the first half? Well, we just got to keep the ball, try to keep the ball like we did the, the first half and hopefully stay in there with them. They're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're big enough, they're going to wear us down a little bit, but we just got to stick in there. Coach, how do you plan on attacking Seminole in the second half? Very similar to the way we did the first half, you know. We just got to stay right in there and try to keep the ball away from them and keep it in our possession. Thank you so much, Coach Austin. Best of luck. And now back to you, Eric. All right, thanks a lot, Kim. Both teams are ready to take the field, but we still have a few more minutes left before we start the second half. It's the 5A District 8 Championship. It's only a one-touchdown lead. Seminole will get the football back to start the third quarter right after this. Game of the week, week number eight, and you can't ask for a bigger one than right here at St. Petersburg's John Sexton Field, home of the Northeast Vikings. You can call them knee high. You can call them the leaders right now. They're ahead, seven to nothing. Eric Keaton, Sandy Penner, Kimberly Kalinske is on the sidelines. It's a man right there who scored the touchdown, number 30. He ran so fast he lost one of the zeros off of his helmet. It was just a one-yard touchdown run. It's six for the season. Seven to nothing is our score. Seminole set to get the football to start the third quarter of play. How do you get that number back on? You can you glue it or duct tape it back? You know, duct tape works great with anything. I know you're aware yeah. of that. <laughs> That's right. Duct tape fixes everything and uh, fixes tanks. Hey, put some in duct the tape on. It'll work. DeWitt with the kick and a whistle as the kick, and it's at the 40-yard line. So it will be a Viking infraction, and they'll back it up to the 35-yard line, and they'll have to kick it again. I know it's uh, just going to be the first drive of the second half, but I think it's a part of that Seminole get something going here and start winning the field position battle. And Because, uh, you know, you, you, you go three and out here. Northeast gets the ball back. They get a score. I don't care if it's 10 nothing, 14 nothing. Here you have a team that doesn't pass. It's going to have to try and get back in the ball game with switching quarterbacks and their star running back who has, you know, just a few carries in the first half. Ready to start the second half. One of the injured Vikings with his own uh, rendition of the helmet cam. We'll call it the... Uh, looks like, oh, it's one of his crutches. Helmet crutch. Helmet crutch. Short kick. Could go out of bounds. Gaucher will take it at the 11-yard line. Gaucher gets back to the 26, and that's where Seminole will start the second half. Field scored a touchdown to end the first half, and he makes the tackle here to start the second half of play. The Seminole Warhawks in their schedule, unbeaten. The only unbeaten team left in Pinellas County. They started out with a big one against Lakewood. That's the only team, Sandy, 5-2, and two, that they played with a winning record besides tonight. Took care of Boca Ciega, who was a very good 3-4 and four team, and East Lake as well. Gibbs, a lot better than their 2-5 and five record. They barely won that game by six points and had a dogfight with Tarpon Springs and against Osceola and got a, some revenge against a the team they lost to last year. And after this, it's St. Pete and Clearwater, two teams they could see again in the playoffs. But the winner of tonight's game is the district champion, regardless of what happens the rest of the season. Where's the quarterback? And this will be Joey Fabrizio. And Fabrizio maybe got a yard, and that is it, as he is horse collared at around the 26-yard line. A couple of common denominators in Seminole's schedule. First of all, when they're beating teams, they're getting way ahead and they're scoring a ton of points. And uh, when they're having close games, it's when teams are doing what Northeast is doing, kind of grinding it, grinding them down, trying to play physical football, keeping their offense off the field a little bit. And Gibbs nearly beat them doing that. Parizio was credited for a yard. Fields just hung on for the ride. Big hit on the pitch, going back to Fabrizio. And Fabrizio would just have to fall on the football as Ware was hit as he made that pitch. That's an outstanding play. 
by the Northeast defense as Fabrizio heads up said I just need to fall on this one and just take our losses. Heads up play by Fabrizio to make the play. The ball's thrown way away from him. He bats it down with his left hand. See so you hit the quarterback there. It is Frederick. Not something Coach Roper wants to see. Jeremy Frederick gets in there and forces a third and long situation for Seminole. A passing situation for most teams, but they'll keep it on the ground. No, they'll roll out here with Ware. He'll just toss it out here to Gauthier, and Gauthier might have had the first down if he held on to the football, and now tempers flare, and the flags come out as both teams go at it. And this one may be on Seminole. Yeah, I think Gauthier's going to get the penalty there right after the play. He took a shot at, uh, I want to say it was, uh, I don't know what was out there. Was it? Uh, it was Sammy Edwards. Here. Yeah, I think it was. And yeah, just complete frustration there. And it is against the Warhawks, so they'll back it up. And here's the end of this play. Gets hit. And then the hit, and automatically, I believe that's Jay Austin and Coach Korn, the defense coordinator, stepping in there to tell their man, no, don't retaliate. We'll get a free 15. Got to play smart football. I know there's a little frustration setting it for Seminole, but you got to be smart. Every yard's important. And especially here, going to back up Seminole near their own goal line here for the field position game. And it's, you're talking about the very important drive, and they're going to get nothing out of it. Fourth penalty for 30 yards against Seminole. And they'll have to punt this one away from the 14. And Riley standing at his goal line. So watch out. They need a good snap here. Trailing at 7 to nothing. Around midfield is where Flower and Edwards. Good punt by Riley. Flower will call the fair catch. And this time he makes sure that everybody sees him. Here's the whistle and he catches it right near midfield. They'll actually mark him at the 45 yard line of Seminole. It's a great field position for Northeast. Since when did a uh, former speaker of the house, Tip O'Neill, start coaching the Northeast Vikings? We were that talking about that, he does not look like Tip O'Neill. No? Tip O'Neill had a more, he had a round uh, nose. Coach Austin doesn't have a round nose like that. You don't think so without no, the glasses? No, 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 even without the glasses. Is that a reach? No. That's a reach, that one's a reach. See, I can give you Coach Brook and uh, John Lithgow. You like that one? Yeah, that, that one I like. First possession for the Northeast Vikings to start the second half. And great field position. And they'll pick up three yards here as Fields in a steady dose of work. He'll gain maybe two, bring up a second down and eight from the 42-yard line of Seminole. Bad sequence of plays for Seminole there. You got a possible first down. Gaucher drops the ball, gets the penalty. Now they're punting. All of a sudden, you got Northeast here on the 43-yard line driving. As I said, you get down 10 nothing, get down 14 nothing for non-passing team. Yep. Major problems. And that's not just Seminole. There's a lot of teams like that in high school football where they're run-oriented and they fall behind and they just can't put the football in the air effectively. Second down and eight. He'll pitch it to Flower. Flower left side. Flower will get to the 40-yard line, and that is about it. Gaucher helped pull him down as well, but he had some help by those Seminole men up front. No tip O'Neill, you don't think? No tip O'Neill. I'm trying to think of a uh, name for Dominic Flower. So good with nicknames. And right now you just... Nine carries and 57 yards. Nothing comes to mind. You find a tag on a middle name for Something, him? yeah, because of the flower, his Blooming last name. Flower, yeah. Yeah. Northeast crowd trying to come to life. Here in this football game, big third down conversion here, and a flag comes out, or we'll call a time, by the officials. And it will be a flag delay of game against Northeast. They had a third down and five. Instead, they're going to have a third down. Well, actually, they'll have a third down and 11 now. Mark it back at the 45-yard line. How much is the nickname for Flower? Florist? The Florist. Yeah, that's what we're talking about reach. Yeah. Third down and 11 for Northeast. Trying to make something out of this first possession of the third quarter. 
Harris to put it in the air. Rush is on. He's going deep, looking for a flower wide open, and he just overthrew him at the 10 yard line. While we have this moment, let's go down on the sidelines, talk to Kimberly Kalinsky for an injury report. We do have an injury report on Corinthian Thompson. He has pulled his hip flexor muscle, and there's a possibility that he will be out for the game. All right, thanks a lot, Kim. And it doesn't look like he's going to be returning to action anytime soon. Flower just couldn't catch up to that one as Harris. There's a nice throw out there, but not nice enough. The Seminole defense after that five-yard penalty forces a punt, and it's a bad punt. Shanked out of bounds near the 35-yard line. It's only a 10-yard punt for DeWitt. Right by Scott Epstein, our producer, and Kimberly Kalinsky. We'll take a quick break. 8.48 left in the third quarter. Northeast on top by seven. Danger quarterback for Seminole. They put Coleman back in there. They're alternating possessions now from their own 35-yard line. Coleman's going to throw it. Now he decides to run, and he'll be taken down as he barely gets across the line of scrimmage. Closing in on him like bookends, Joe Gamble was one of the first guys in there, only the sophomore, and he's 5'7", 180. You know what's great about Kimberly Kalinske, and then to this play, Seminole's not comfortable throwing the ball. So it's almost pseudo-designed run, and there's just no, Northeast doesn't have to respect uh, the deep ball. Coleman's fortunate that he picked up a yard on the play as it seemed to shut down as the Northeast Vikings are ready to throw out some goodies here. To the fans, pretty good crowd on both sides of the field. And second down and nine, and now too much time for Seminole. So, Sandy, you touched on it earlier, some sloppy play. In the first half, you mentioned it, and uh, definitely some sloppy play. You'd think that both teams coming out of the locker room would have uh, an agenda ready for the second half, especially in a big game like this. I could not, as I mentioned, that essay that I'll write one day about why I'm not a coach, I could not at all tolerate uh, delay of game penalties. For some reason, it would just be the one thing, as you said, that would eat in my crawl, whatever you said, eat away in my crawl. <laughs> you mix your metaphors <laughs> yeah. up, I think a little bit there. <laughs> I was thinking, I said, man, I'm gonna say something from the Brady Bunch, I'll never hear the end of it, but oh well, it didn't work out anyway. Fabrizio, three, four red shirts around him, he's fortunate enough to stay on his feet. And he picks up a couple more yards. He's still gonna bring up a third down and long, as he got most of those yards back after the penalty. Third down, it's important third down here for Seminole. A lot of time left in the game, but continuing to get first downs, giving your defense a chance to rest, and starting to win the field position battle, important now, especially since they haven't scored yet. It's a third down and six. From the 37, Coleman going to put it in the air. Coleman pulls it back down, has a lot of room near sideline. He will have the first down. Coleman bounces off his own man. And he's taken down at the 36-yard line of Northeast. A big run, the biggest play for Seminole, 25 yards. And you can see they lost containment, they lost their running lanes, and, and I'm not sure exactly why, and this is something obviously uh, that Coach Austin will not be happy about because you have a situation where you've got a backup quarterback in there, not comfortable throwing the ball, didn't even look like he wanted to throw the ball, and you just got to stay in your lane to keep containment and realize that he's the major threat on that play. You don't have to really gets sucked 30 yards down the field. Boy, Lauren Zetti did a great job on Eric Gamble just taking him right out of the play. Fabrizio up the middle, bouncing off Vikings. Picks up maybe four for Seminole. Gets to the 32-yard line. Do you know the Kimberly Klinsk her hair down in the first half, and now is it up in the second half? It's the different looks. It's the, you know, she's, Looks like Scott Epstein's proposing to her. He's down what, on one knee down there. What he's doing down there. But she's we'll almost, get back to the game. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Get off on a tangent here. Second down and six. This is Gauthier. Gauthier. Wrapped up by Ross. Ross worked off the block of Fabrizio and somehow like did a backhand and grabbed a hold of Gauthier and took him down. Looked like a kickboxing move.
just sniffed out, snuffed out, whatever you want to call it. Gotta love the smell of barbecue wafting in the air from the tailgating going on here. Beautiful, good atmosphere tonight. Loss on the play makes it a third down and seven. Again, a passing situation. Will they pass it? Yes, they will. It's Coleman. Coleman looking downfield, throws it up for his man. It's tipped up in the air, and will a flag come out. Pass intended for 85, Kyle Reed, and contact was made by the smaller defensive back, Sammy Edwards, and a flag came out. Well, it looked like it was simultaneous with the ball and the contact, but we'll have to wait and see the replay. And we'll give Seminole a first down. I don't know if it's Sammy Edwards or even Josh Harris, actually, on this play. And it's, and it's, it's, no, it was Sammy Edwards, right? And it's a, you know, that call, we know the high school ruler, because you've talked about before. But, uh, well, you have a five foot five guy going up against a six foot three guy. He's trying to get any advantage. Instead, marginal, marginal call at best. It will move the ball to the, a 15 yard penalty to the 19 yard line. And a first down for Seminole. 538 remaining in the third quarter. Trailing it by a touchdown. Handoff going to Gauthier. Gauthier dragging tacklers down to the 12 yard line. That's a pickup of seven for the Seminole Warhawks. This is when you're gonna see that Seminole offensive line try and go to work. Get Lawrence Zetti out there pulling out and just taking up space. Jason Ford also out there getting down the field a little bit. You know, and you hope as you get to the fourth quarter, Eric, the offensive line has done enough of the job in wearing down Northeast defense that you take the game away from them in the fourth quarter. Second and three, almost a problem with the exchange from center. Fabrizio taken down, a beautiful tackle by Fields. Fields scoring the touchdown, and he's playing both ways as well. Nothing for Fabrizio on this play. And they are just making a concerted effort to get to Fabrizio before he can get the legs moving, wrap him up. It's a third down and two coming up. Ninth play of the drive for Seminole. Gaucher, Gaucher slipped and fell at the 11-yard line. He's going to be short of the first down. It'll be a fourth and maybe a yard and decision time for Coach Roper, and I believe with his field goal kicker, he's gonna send in Riley. Good move here, kick the field goal, you get points on the board, you're still gonna have to get a touchdown at some point, give your offense a little confidence. You hold it at the 17 yard line, and it will be a 27 yard field goal, straight on for Riley. Kick is down, and that kick is through the uprights. The Seminole Warhawks get on the board with a Coleman 25-yard run and a 15-yard penalty. It helped them out. It's 7-3. Northeast is on top. Play drive, five minutes and two seconds, a 27-yard field goal by Morgan Riley, and he's ready to kick it off. It's a seven to three ball game now, 341 left in the third quarter. And as I said, Bernard Coleman's 25-yard run at quarterback, and also a 15-yard pass interference play helped Seminole get on the board. Riley with the kick. And it will be taken by Fields at the two-yard line. Fields. I'll uh, check that and make that number 31. That's Sammy Edwards. Sammy Edwards getting his hands on the football. Excuse me. Northeast will start out at the 25-yard line of first and 10 for Josh Harris, who Harris coming in as the second leading passer next to Pat Carter in Pinellas County. My record stats only show he's completed one pass for eight yards, and that's it. Yeah, and they haven't thrown much. They've kept the ball on the ground. Uh, they had the one deep ball which they tried to get. Basically, it was open, but overthrown. Basically, they stayed pretty conservative. This will be number 
30. Fields, Fields spins out with a couple of tackles and gets to the 31-yard line. They get the second down and four. Hey, Chief, Dusty Baker's kid nearly got run over last what night. What was that? He was run. He was just running that was a live play. I don't know what he was doing. It reminds me of a kid's going to get the tees. One day, one of those kids is going to kind of futz around with the tee, and he's going to get run over by a returner. Right. I know guy returning up the middle. Yeah, he's going to be out there late, and it's all going to just, the whole plan is just going <laughs> to. Either that channels. or I'll make a great tackle. Yeah. Second down and four for Northeast. Pitch it again. Coming this way is Clemens. Clemens might have picked up two. That's about it. And as you said, Santa, they're just keeping the football on the ground. Trying to wear down that Seminole front. That Seminole front, as I said last year, number one in the county coming in at number 12 and allowing 128 yards on the ground. You see, uh, you know, Akamovsky's coming up and giving support for Brizio. Even Ty Hicks back there getting up and giving run support here. It's the battle wills here as we head towards the fourth quarter. Third down and two. Harris has yet to try to hit the pool on a deep pass. Another running situation for Harris. He'll pitch it back to Fields. Fields hit near the line of scrimmage. Goes forward and gets the first down across the 35-yard line. The ball came loose, but all the officials pointing toward the ground saying it's a first down, and he was down by contact. They obviously see something they like over there. Wow, I'm not sure if he was down or not there, Sandy. We'd have to take another look at that. Looked like he was airborne when the ball scooted out. This would probably be a little bit better of an angle to see it from. Ah, the other angle was better coming straight at our goal cam. But no argument by Seminole. Eight carries for 33 yards for Fields. Coming this way, it's Clemens again. Clemens trying to turn that corner. Had it and gets pushed out of bounds and injured. Viking gets taken down as well. That's got to hurt. See, you did play tonight. That's Clifford Bragg. I think you're safe on the sidelines. You got your crutch. You got your brace. And no, you're not. And either talk about play calling. You see what uh, Coach Austin's doing here. Mix it up a little bit. Running over left side, running over left side, running over left side, pounding for the yards. Come right back and go to the right side. Bragg's had his back turned to the play as well. Next time he'll be watching the action that's going on. He says, yeah, I'll take my my crutch here and just take him out. What do you think about that? Second down and two. Clemens picks up eight. They give it to Clemens again. Clemens hitting the backfield, almost escaped it, couldn't do it. Morgan Riley, the first one in there. Eventually he's wrapped up by big number 99, Raphael Wallace. He'll lose a yard on the play and bring up a third down and three. I think Ray Pike was in on this too. This is just uh, good penetration here. Oh, well, Ray Pike gets a hold of you. Uh, you likely are not going anywhere. Morgan Riley with sporting the hairdo. Almost like yours. Yeah, it looked like he was wearing his helmet before. Did the highlights you here for the game tonight? Not before the game, no. no. It was a week or so ago. All right. Third down. Harris putting it in the air, rushes on. He's just going backwards. Tries to throw this one that Fabrizio couldn't hold on. I believe he was out of bounds anyway if he would have made the catch. So it will be a fourth down and three for Northeast. They'll have to punt it away as another passing situation. Seminole just got good push up front. This time the pressure coming from, again, Akamovsky. Yeah, Akamovsky and even Ray Pike got out there and strung that play out. And it's been difficult for Northeast to really, for the receivers to be able to get separation tonight. Seminole has defended the pass very well. Northeast, we're trying to get a better punt than he did the last time. A little better, but not outstanding. Soriano is hit as he tried to make the fair catch. Oh, that was brutal. So wonder Siano's back on both feet. That's just cool, and he's hitting himself on the head. He'll be fortunate if uh, Coach Austin uh, does less than that when he gets back to the sideline. That's just ugly, Ooh. ugly, ugly stuff. I mean, not only is there a guy of a chance, and it, certainly he's not doing it purposely. He may not have seen that he was calling for a fair catch. But not only can the guy get hurt, but it's just an obvious penalty, which is going to cost you yardage. And at this point, the tight game can't afford it. Hey, he's, he's laid up for a second. I'm not sure what he was thinking, Eric. Well, at least he didn't lead with his helmet, which could have been buried in Siano's chest. The seventh penalty 
for 60 yards against Northeast. And the second one of this quarter, that will be a 15-yarder and aid in field position for the Seminole Warhawks. 44 seconds left in the third quarter. Penalties, penalties, penalties. And you can't avoid them. It's football, it's a physical game, but you just see there's certain ones that are just, that are just dark, absolutely killers. I to remind you the Bucks extra point coming up this Monday live after the game with Carolina, big uh, South showdown, live at six. And Seminole declined that penalty. I'm not sure if they would have had to make a Northeast punt again, but that's quite odd. Even if they had to punt again, Sandy, I'd still make them do it, or why would you just give up 15 yards from the point of the foul? So that's not tacked on. I'm a little confused that that's not tacked on at the point. Tacked on at the point of the foul, unless they, you know. That's what our clock operator is explaining to us up here, one of the officials saying that it is understanding the rules, it should have been tacked on, but it's basically no Seminole punishment for Northeast on a penalty. Right, I, I guess Seminole thought, or maybe it was explained to them that Northeast would have to punt it over. Second down. This is Fabrizio. Fabrizio on a big run here for Joey Fab. He gets a first down, and he's near midfield. He's up to the 44-yard line. He'll have a first down for Seminole with three seconds left in the quarter. And that'll do it here for the third quarter. Fabrizio, nine carries, 29 yards, not the numbers he's accustomed to. Harris hasn't had a good night at quarterback, but he's done his job as a safety. We have 12 minutes left in the 5A8 district championship. It's a repeat of last year's game. It's a defensive struggle, but Northeast has the four-point lead. cheerleading crew here, their team, plenty to cheer about, but it's only a four-point lead, and we're in the fourth quarter, a very quick ball game. Here on the TW, TV 47 High School Football Game of the Week, 12 minutes left in the contest. Winner of this one will claim an automatic playoff berth in the Florida Finals. Coleman in at quarterback. This is Fabrizio. Fabrizio picks up five. It'll be a second down and five near the 49-yard line. I was trying to get some clarification on that uh, fair catch non-penalty where Seminole declined the penalty. I still, for the life of me, can't figure out why they declined the penalty. They just wasted having a chance to get 15 yards. I still don't understand exactly what happened. We were talking to one of the officials in the booth, and uh, it doesn't make any sense. Call the second down and six for Seminole. Again, a steady dose of Joey Fabrizio, but he's wrapped up in the backfield. He does not go down, but there is a tackle in the backfield by one of the smallest guys on the field, and Sammy Edwards, only five foot five. Very active tonight. Sammy Edwards has had uh, good plays, bad plays tonight. He's been all over the place. He's uh, he's been involved in the action. He's sticking his nose in there despite his lack of size. And I think obviously what you see here is what we talked about at halftime, Eric. Fabrizio get the ball a lot in the second half. Hopefully the defense is worn down, and it's, uh, as I said before, a battle of attrition now. Well, Edwards isn't worn down. He's just getting warmed up. Third down and seven. Coleman to put the football in the air. Has an open receiver, and he finds him for the first down. Slips a tackle. This is number 25, Tori Zanol, and Zanol is inside Viking territory down at the 33-yard line. He'll pick up 23 on the completed pass. DeAndre Poole and Josh Harris both missing tackles on this play, which allowed extra yardage. And nice little, nice little play here. You just roll your quarterback out, get him away from the pressure a little bit. Step out 10 yards, sit down right there. And nice play. First down for Seminole, Gaucher. Nothing on the outside, cuts it back up the middle. Find a little running room on the inside, and he'll pick up three down to the 32-yard line. Coleman's making some plays, Eric, for Seminole. He had the long run. He's rolled out a little bit. He's not afraid to put the ball in the air. He was shaky at first, but now that he's settled into a rhythm a little bit, uh, he's obviously the guy that can 
get this team in the end zone. He's the junior, led him to the field goal in the last possession. Where's the senior? And Coach Roper said that Coleman's been getting better every week. Coach again goes in motion. This will be Fabrizio, straight up the middle, trying to leap over the line, but he's sent backwards as he reached the 30. Edwards, don't tell me he's in on another tackle. Five foot, he's playing like he's about six foot five tonight. I think he's using those crutches by Bragg. Fabrizio jumping over center Kyle Sand there. And they teach you not to jump in the air. And the reason they teach you not to jump in the air is you got guys like, guys like Sandy Edwards sticking his helmet right in the middle of your chest. It's probably why they tell you not to do that. Aided him and in, indefinitely in going low. A third down and six coming up for the Warhawks. Mishandle on the snap. Coleman has to run for it. And he's wrapped up by Ross and taken down. Probably some, some issues there with Coleman and, uh, and Sam, the center, as far as the the handoff's going, that's about about the third or fourth one where there's, and that's that's on Coleman. He's just pulling out a little too early before he has a chance to really have a, have a, uh, have a hold of the ball. Well, it'll be a fourth down and a long three coming up for Seminole. The ball is marked at the 28-yard line. Morgan Riley has made a 44 and 47-yard field goal on the season, but uh, Coach Roper says we're going to keep this drive alive. The eighth play to start the fourth quarter. Coleman's going to put it in the air. Looking to go deep, he'll overthrow this one and nearly intercepted, but Edwards decided to just let it fall through his hands, didn't backpedal. It falls incomplete, and Northeast will take over. I don't mind going for it there. It's not the worst thing. It's too long for a field goal. The defense played well enough you can hold them. Uh, I would have liked to see Eric a little bit different of a look and Coleman rolling out a little more, maybe to the right side where he doesn't have to throw back against his body. The play worked the last time. Then you give him two options. He could throw the ball, or make a play with your legs. Obviously, they're taking Fabrizio away, and uh, interesting to go to the left side where he's got to throw against his body. Put the ball at the 28-yard line for Northeast. 8.26 left in the ball game. Harris coming out to meet his offense to get the play in. They've had the running game going. Several ball carriers tonight. Clemens, Flower, Fields, Frederick. Flower, Flower hit by Ciano and taken down. He crosses the 30 to the 32 yard line. It'll be a second down and seven. I'm talking about running the left side. Eric, this has got to be the 12th to 20th time they've run this play where just on the off on the offensive line, you've got Messer, you've got Richards just basically pulling out. I mean, they're getting off. They're not even, they're not blocking at the point of attack line. It's going to be just pulling out and it's getting big yardage. It's typically what works. Richard's doing a nice job on Fabrizio on that play, putting his hands on him, pushing him back, aiding the Flower to collect more yards on 10 carries. This is Fields, Fields, right side. Fields wrapped up by Ray Pike. Pike chased him down and just lands on him for a yard and a half, two yard loss. Pike's got a good feel for the game. He understands, he understands space, he understands filling gaps. And he's basically chasing that play down from behind. Just a, a nice junior. game tonight, yeah. 6'1", 256 could be the uh, next great uh, senior that this team, Seminole, has. They always have great senior ball players. Daniel Williams, Eric Hunter, Dequel Jackson, and the names ring a bell. Joey Fabrizio this year, Lauren Zetti. Gaucher, another one. Timeout on the field. Ray Pike, just a junior. He could be when he's a senior. 7-0-8 left in the ball game. It's a four-point advantage for the homestanding Northeast Vikings. School football game of the week. It's the 5A8 District Championship. Eric Keaton, Sandy Penner on the sidelines. Tampa Bay Buccaneer cheerleader Kimberly Kalinski with all the information you would ever need to know from the sidelines for high school football. The Northeast Vikings have a third down and eight from their own 31 yard line. And they have the lead. Harris going to put it up in the air. Lofting this one up, looking for his tight end, Ryan Ross. And he's well covered by Ciano. It falls incomplete. And Northeast will have to punt the football away. They only used about a minute and a half off the clock. 
Be surprised by the uh, inability, Eric, in this game of Northeast to really get their passing game going. Just hasn't been there. And it, 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 I, I don't know if it's receivers not getting separation, uh, but something has just been a little out of sync. When they have game. Harris, when they have gotten somebody open, Harris has been out of sync and he's overthrown. There, that had to be a very accurate pass to get it in there. Ross had a tiny seam. A return, bobbling it is Siano. Siano straight up the middle and he crosses the 50 yard line and he gets to the 46 of Northeast. Let's go down to the sidelines now. 6.53 left in the fourth quarter. You know when we approach the midway point, that means it's fan of the game time. Go ahead, Kimberly. They have been searching all night, and the Wild 98.7 Street team has found the loudest, most energetic fan, Eric Heeman. I wonder if he's tough. Heeman. He is this week's Wild 98.7 fan of the game. Congratulations. He's there showing all his spirit. He's definitely an energetic fellow, and he's won a great prize pack. So congratulations to you, Eric, and enjoy. I didn't get the prize pack. That Eric did. Greg Ware back in at quarterback, and he delivers a strike to Kyle Reed at wide receiver on the pass play and Seminole picks up eight yards to the 38 yard line of Northeast. So Ware back in at quarterback. So have a Coach Roper, you're inside seven minutes here. You've had a couple of good drives with your backup quarterback and you go back to Ware and you get an eight yard completion. And it was a bullet. He's gonna put it in there again. Same play, the opposite side and it will be a first down. Edwards is in on the tackle but Reed has back-to-back -back receptions on basically back-to-back -back calls at the same play, just different sides of the field. Timberwolves have done enough with their passing game for Northeast to be giving this much of a cushion out there in the corners. They just simply haven't. This ball's basically up for grabs, but there's a, an eight, a nine hit on yard where. cushion there. You know, you got where, hasn't they been throwing too many passes tonight? I'm up, I'm playing bump and run. I'm not giving away anything at this point. First down near the 30-yard line of Northeast. Fabrizio, he'll pick up three, get down to the 27 yard line. Four down territory, you think so? It's got to be. With 544 and counting, yes, it is again four down territory. Field goal's not going to do anything for you. No guarantee you're getting the ball no. back. Four down territory here. So second down, it's actually a good thing. Second down doesn't become all that important like it would be if you were just trying to three three downs, then figuring out what you're going to do. We'll run the ball wide here again. Or they'll put it in the air. Rushes on, ball tipped up in the air, falls incomplete as the quarterback Ware was just destroyed in the backfield. And the oncoming tackler, I believe, is still down, that being Jeremy Frederick, and I believe he got the most of that hit. He's coming off the corner there, and Ware doesn't even see him. Looks like he got hit by Ware's elbow in the face. You want to be doling out the punishment, not getting hurt yourself <laughs> you're, you're coming the defensive off the court. end coming in, man. Yeah, kind of like when Justin used to play our statistician. He, That's you know, right. He's actually getting hurt more than he was dishing out the punishment, even though he's the one giving the hits. Of course, he was also long snapping. He had to uh, take his time on the... Yeah. And Wouldn't want to snap the ball over you know, anyone's head or anything like that. That's right. Well, uh, let's take a time out here with Seminole and Northeast and gives us a chance to see Kimberly Kalinske in action. We've seen Danielle Foster on the sidelines. We've had her here. And there's Kim doing what she does on Sunday afternoon. Of course, uh, her next time you'll see her in action will be against the Vikings. And the Vikings are in town November 3rd. I don't, Kimberly, Kimberly, I don't know if we Kimberly? have any music playing right now. Does what Kimberly, kind of music would we sing to this? I don't know, but I don't know if Kimberly realizes that she was on my show about three months ago. She was on the Buck Trader, which still just hasn't put it two and two together. I remember. I remember the best of the best. Don't worry. I got gotcha. you. Third down. Coleman back in at quarterback. And Coleman is short. He gets across the 25 to the 24-yard line. Brings up a fourth down. And here's the fourth down situation, a fourth down and a very long three yards. And they are going to go for it. You have to. Were you surprised that Coleman was back in at quarterback? Uh, I, I'm not surprised on this play. Where hurt? I, I get him. I don't know if where got hurt, but get Coleman rolling out a little bit here. They'll hand it off for Brizio straight up the middle. He is near the first down. Seminole says we have it. And it is 
there's a first down according to Jerry Hicks. The fourth down conversion for Seminole with number four running the football. Go with your bread and butter, I guess. Go with the guy that brung you to the dance. And you know they went quickly to that play. They didn't take a timeout. They didn't take time to discuss in the huddle. They sent in the personnel they needed. Went up to the ball, snapped it, and got the first down. Caught the defense on its heels. It wasn't really a hurry-up play, but it was quick enough to pick up the first down at the 20-yard line for Seminole. Again, Fabrizio. Fabrizio will score the touchdown and the lead for the Warhawks. second half and it was just a matter of wearing down the defense. Gachet actually gets a good little push type block here at the end. You'll see the offensive line went to work. Gachet at the end getting through and bam! Little block and Fabrizio making the plays. That's what great players do, Eric. And a little baseball slide to boot. His 13th touchdown of the season. And the extra point try now by the Warhawks. To make it a 10-7 lead with 4.23 left in the ball game. Morgan Riley connected on a 27-yard field goal and his extra point try is true. It is a three-point lead for Seminole, Joey Fabrizio. They said they'd show him in the second half and they didn't lie to us. 20-yard touchdown run and Seminole has the lead. Harris is the hurt Viking at the 15-yard line, which wouldn't bode well for Northeast. Uh, their quarterback that they're going to need now trailing by three, the first time they've trailed in the ball game. A six-play, 46-yard drive by the Seminole Warhawks, two minutes and 33 seconds. Joey Fabrizio, you see his numbers on the night. He scored the 20-yard touchdown run, his 13th of the season. To give Seminole the lead. It started late in the second quarter. Fields, his sixth touchdown of the season, a one-yard run, made it seven to nothing. In the third quarter, Riley, a 27-yard field goal for Seminole, made it seven to three. They trailed by four, and they just took the lead. As Riley will kick off to Edwards, and also standing back there is Clemens. I kick Clemens, looks to take it at the two. Heading up the middle. And he'll be taking out. Lost the football on the front goal. Seminole picks it up. And they're going to score back-to-back -back touchdowns. Ty Hicks. What a huge hit for Seminole's number 77. I believe it was Cody Johnson. Jarred the ball free. Seminole football. Take the lead. You come out. Your special teams makes a big play. And it didn't look like it was that much of a hit. It kind of caught up there. It was either Sean Bouvier or number 77, Cody Johnson. Both of them got in on the tackle. But Ty Hicks picks it up alertly and takes it into the end zone. It's shot out of there like a cannon. And a huge play. Could be 17-7 after the extra point. A 10-point lead, scoring two touchdowns in a matter of 10 seconds. Point for Riley, 17 to seven. Seminole on top by 10. If you just went to pick up a coke or something from the refrigerator, is no mistake. Seminole kicks off a big hit on the return. Clemens fumbles, and then number 32, Ty Hicks picks it up, and Jerry Austin's team is trailing by 10. We want to talk about air being let out of a balloon. The life's been sucked out of this uh, this stadium, and the Northeast team faster than Scott Epstein have sucked out of box of Krispy Kremes or something like that or whatever. <laughs> but uh, it didn't look like much of a hit there. Kind of ran into ran into two guys and 15 yards later. It looked like Sean Bouvier got a hand in there or 
But you have to give Cody Johnson credit as well and let the celebration begin. But still four minutes and 14 seconds left in this ball game. And right now the only turnover is the big margin for Seminole. They were trailing at 7-3, to three, but they've scored back-to-back -back touchdowns here in a matter of 10 seconds. One on the Fabrizio 20-yard run, and then on special teams on the kickoff. So they'll try it again. You sense a big difference in the, uh, and again, I know it's only high school football, but it seems to me that Seminole's been a better conditioned team here in the second half. And sometimes when you're a little tired, I don't know if that fumble is because you're a little tired, you start making mistakes, start arm tackling as they did with Fabrizio in the last drive when he got the touchdown, and that's when the other team takes over. That's what's happened with Seminole here. Well, one thing that I've seen slip away from Northeast over the years since they had that winning streak during the regular season and made several trips to the playoffs, going deep into the playoffs, the final four, the final eight, is they've lost that Northeast Vikings swagger. They've always had uh, the characteristics. Now an onside kick, almost recovered by Riley. It's still loose. Seminole may have recovered their own onside kick with the dagger into the Viking heart. That swagger will immediately disappear here. Any of it that was left is gone. On the road? I'm not sure I'm in love with the call. Well, they barely got it. It must have hit three or four players before it finally rested into the hands of a Seminole Warhawk. I'm not sure I'm in love with it, but if it works, fine. When it works, you're in love with it. If it I does guess at least, guess at least you're not expecting it. If anything, it would have given Northeast Good field, field position at around the sure. 35. Catches everybody off guard, including Northeast and us. Fabrizio back to the ground game. He'll pick up five yards down to the 31-yard line. Got to start thinking about your timeouts here. Yes. Clock's going to be inside four minutes. You're down 10. Someone's got to make a play. We always talk about this. Who's going to make a play on defense now for Northeast? They're let down. Kids are, kids are tired, but there's still football left to be played. And uh, this is Fabrizio time. I'll tell you what, you pick and choose when you're going to call those plays. And that one right there, we weren't ready for it. Northeast definitely wasn't ready for it. Seminole could very easily end the ball game here by just running out the clock. Fabrizio will run across the 30. And they'll mark him down at the 30. Northeast needs to stop the clock, and they do stop the time now with 321 left. Gutsy call, so I kick it over, an onside kick up 10. You know, that doesn't work. Let's say Northeast recovers. They get the ball midfield down 10. All of a sudden they stick in a score there, less than two minutes left, and we've got a ball game. As I said, I don't know if I like the call. I only like it because it worked. Well, that's gotta be one of the best plays of the year. We were talking earlier about Coach Austin's play calling, but right there for Coach Roper to say, yeah, we're gonna go for it. Let's go for the onside kick. I'm pretty sure the kids were like, they were the ones, we're going to do what? <laughs> we got a 17-7 lead. You want us to onside kick? Siano, Siano picks up the first down, and you can just hear the wind escaping the Northeast Vikings. He's across the 25, down to the 23. And when you hear the band playing that song for the Warhawks, you know they're going in for the kill. This was not working all that well in the first half. Northeast was really able to, as I said, flow to the ball. But in the second half, it's been the it's been the big ends up front with Seminole, at least in the fourth quarter. Because uh, you say, you know, you're going to see the end of this game, 17-7, Seminole, you know, but this was a, uh, this was a very, very hard-fought game that just Seminole in the fourth quarter won at the line of scrimmage. From the 24, Siano in motion. This will be Fabrizio. Fabrizio will pick up a couple more. You talked about the big ends up front, and over the summer, those guys went to the UCF offensive line camp, and here's some video footage of those guys. We've talked about Lawrence Eddy, Blackledge Sand, Dadswell, and Ford. They average about 240, and part of the competition is not going against each other in pads. They had to push a band a certain time and a certain distance. Is Scott Epstein in that and band? They, they, they're won, pushing. they won the competition. Seen that at band? UCF, the Seminole offensive line, and they've won the competition here in the game, and as you said, the biggins up front here in the fourth quarter, wearing them down, a second down and eight. Ciano 
just dragging men in red down to the 14-yard line. He's near the sticks. Less than two minutes left in the ball game. Before that carry, guys like Fabrizio, 70 yards. Gaucher, 32. Coleman, 29. 150 plus yards rushing tonight, and the majority of those coming in the second half when they only had like 40 at halftime. I'll tell you that, Lorenzetti is a horse. He's had a monster game. He's really been great in the second half, and a uh, uh, man child out there. Third down and short. Northeast can't stop it. This is Fabrizio. Fabrizio will have a first and goal for Seminole. The party's over. I don't know any of the rest of the words of the song. And I forgot to look for it on one of my search engines. This is weird. Search engines. <laughs> Boy, how this game just got out of hand for oh, Northeast. I mean, the fumble, re they finally call a timeout here with one minute left, but it's a first and goal. Let's go back again to the University of Central Florida camp, and here's uh, there's the big punisher, Matt Hunley, getting involved in the camp activity. And some tug of war. And that's Seminole. Another one of the competitions. It wasn't just lining up and hitting each other. They wanted to show strength. That's all, that builds team unity. You know, that does more it's than nothing just like a good game of tug of war to skill, build team unity. But building unity as well. Why don't you know, we have a tug of war uh, at Time Warner? For the Who game. Who do we go against? Each just other? Build, just build team unity. I don't put three guys on one side, three on the other. We just have a tug of war. I always hated tug of war. I never really understood. I was always the front man at time. I was always laying that. I wasn't strong enough to be good at it. I just, I just, I never really understood the concept of it, really. But if it's building team unity, I'm for it. <laughs> First and goal for Seminole. It's not like they need the points. And this game just had a sudden turn of events. Use that cliche. 4:24 left in the ball game. Two quick touchdowns by Seminole, and a couple of them plays on special teams. Siano gets down inside the five to the four yard line. The district title ticking away for Northeast and Seminole will claim its third in a row and stay unbeaten on the season at 8-0. Now for Northeast, they'll hope for some help and drop to 6-2, but more likely they'll be in the playoffs. Worst case scenario is a wild card. Ball carriers, Gaucher, Gaucher near the goal line. Seminole says we're in, but no signal yet from the officials. And on the third and goal, Seminole says, we're going to line up from the one-inch line, and we're going to put it in. Am I missing why they're trying to score? Is there some point thing involved that I, that I don't know about? Well, being that they're unbeaten, they would have the top seed. Coleman under center. Time running out. They'll hand it off. No, they'll throw it into the end zone. It almost was picked off with 4.2 seconds left. Now, that's an awkward call here. It would have given a chance for Northeast if they had more time. Make why? more of a game out of it. I just go ahead. If you're going to run a play, why not just give it to your quarterback and let him run it up the middle? Any reason why with Northeast not calling timeouts, they're running a play? As I said, unless I'm missing something here. Because to me, you sit down on one knee, you're up 10, you go home with a victory, hard fought victory. Uh, again, unless I'm missing something, something I don't know about as far as the points go, uh, I don't get it. And a very quick and well played game on both sides except Northeast would disagree saying that fumble and the onside kick not ready for it, it killed us. Fourth and goal, Fabrizio over the top for the touchdown as time expires here on the game of the week. The Seminole Warhawks will claim their third district title and stay unbeaten on the season. point against Jerry Austin's Vikings. 23 to 7 is the final score. 23 unanswered points by the Seminole Warhawks. Stay with us. We'll talk to Coach Roper. We'll talk to Joey Fabrizio. We have talked to Ray Pike. Stay with us.
Welcome back to John Sexton Field, where the Northeast Vikings saw 23 straight points scored by the Seminole Warhawks, and they watched the 5A8 District Championship go over to Seminole for the third straight year. Eric Keaton, Ray Pike, one of the defensive heroes for this game. And, Ray, you have to talk about your effort against Josh Harris. I believe we only had him completed one pass. Talk about your defense tonight. Well, we came in trying to get pressure and keep contain on the quarterback because the more pressure we get on him, the more likely he is to make an incomplete pass. And we just came in and we knew that he was a scrambler and we were just going to try to keep him in the pocket as much as we could. Momentum is a big part in any type of sport. The momentum in this game after Fabrizio scored and then the special teams play back-to-back -back on the fumble return and then the onside kick. Talk about that. How much did that lift your team up? Because it was an amazing swing of momentum. Oh, yeah. I mean, we started getting tired and down, but, like, once we scored a touchdown and got a little bit of a lead, we just, like, our momentum just went straight up. And I just want to say a good job to the special teams. I mean, they were hurting us a little in the, you know, the first half of the season, but they really stepped it up tonight. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, let's bring in Joey Fabrizio. Come on in, Joey. Excuse me, right? Good to see you again. You had a, a sack on defense in the first half. You didn't run the ball that much. No. The whole game plan to get you the ball in the second half seemed to work. Um, well, the first half, Northeast shut it down. I mean, they had good defensive strategy to stop the belly, which we were on. But the uh, second half, my dad, offensive coordinator, said, well, look, we just need to pound him. Let's get after it. We just need to pound him. Third district championship in a row. This is the way to go out. You're a senior. Yeah. But 8-0, uh, no, you guys still have plenty of games left. Obviously, you guys are eyeing the regional. Need to get past that region final this yeah. year. That seems to be killing us this year. But uh, the way we're playing right now, the way our offensive line is playing, the way our defense is gelling now, I... Uh, it's going to be good things happening with us. It's going to be some good things. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, let's bring in your head coach. Come on in, coach. Congratulations, Coach Roper. Thank you. I have to talk about that call for the onside kick. Caught us off guard, caught the Northeast coaches off guard. Whose decision, yours, or were you talked into it? Well, you know, kickers, they kind of do things on their own sometimes. And, uh, and I think when you got a weapon like Morgan, you have to use him. And, uh, you know, we knew they were back there and they had a return. And, uh, you know, we saw, noticed that their guys were back, way back, an extra five yards deeper. And we felt like it was there. And, you know, we didn't want to take a chance on, on getting a long return, you know, for a score. So uh, we gambled and we won. As good as effort as you've seen all season from your team defensively, offensively, and, of course, special teams-wise? Well, <laughs> these players, they're the cardiac kids. I mean, they, they have, uh, you know, just kept us on, on pins and needles throughout the season. I mean, we've gone into some games, and, you know, we're, we're flat coming out of the locker room in the first half. And, I mean, i got to give credit to Northeast's players. I mean, they played a terrific game in the first half, had a good defensive game plan coming in, and, uh, you know, they shut us down pretty well. Coach, congratulations. You're 8-0 and another district title. Thank you very much, and we appreciate Time Warner for coming out and covering the game. Thanks a lot, Coach Roper. Thank you. We'll see you in a few weeks. All right, let's bring in Sandy Penner. And, Sandy, this game, you know, Northeast had the lead 7 to nothing. Seminole scores 23 straight points. I mean, it's easy to point out where this game went awry for Northeast. It was a span of about 15 to 20 seconds, and it happened with about four minutes left in the game. And really, if we want to back up, we can talk about the line of scrimmage. You call them the biggins, but they really started to drive it down their throat, exactly what Coach Fabrizio yeah, and, was and a, his son talked about. It was a physical game we saw in the fourth quarter, really, where Seminole's offensive line took this game over. Fabrizio started to get more carries. Only a few carries, only two carries, I believe, was in the first half. I don't know if they were saving or it's just part of what they've done all season long where they've grind teams down in the fourth quarter and it was obvious that Northeast defense was very tired. Let's talk about the stats in this game. When you look at the final statistics, uh, passing only eight yards for Northeast. They completed only one pass at halftime rushing-wise. Seminole only had 44 yards rushing. They were able to pick up the majority of those in the second half and even completed a few passes. And you know what? One turnover was the big play in the game after Seminole had taken the lead 10-7. Northeast coughs the ball up on the ensuing kickoff, and then they run it in Ty Hicks with the biggest play of the game. Yeah, and Coleman actually made some good plays when he was in the game as well. He's rolling out a little bit. It gave a little spice to their offense. Yeah, I think the onside kick was big. It looked like Northeast was kind of... Uh, out of it at that point. They really, their defense had really let down. And, uh, and also it was their offense, which wasn't able to move the ball much. Remember, they scored in the first half, weren't able to move the ball in the second half, and that was the reason why their defense won the field so long. Down 7 to nothing. Seminole started out the second half. Uh, an easy decision. You heard Coach Roper talk about his field goal kicker, Morgan Riley. A 27-yard field goal here. 
cut the deficit down to four. And then from then on out, a couple drives for Seminole. They went for it on fourth down inside the 30-yard line. They did not make it on one conversion. They did on the second time they tried it. And then Joey Fabrizio here, the 20-yard touchdown run, wearing down the Northeast Vikings. Yeah, wear them down. And, and it, it's interesting to note here that in the first half, Seminole's offense looked kind of out of sync. They were disjointed a little bit in Northeast, which really bringing a lot of guys up to the line of scrimmage. Didn't happen that way in the second half. It was his 13th touchdown of the season for Fabrizio. And then on the ensuing kickoff, just 10 seconds later, this is Clemens straight up the middle. Looks like he's going down. He's sandwiched by a couple of Warhawks. Ty Hicks, right place, right spot, 15 yards later. And all of a sudden, you could hear the air escaping northeast. It was 17-7 after the extra point. And then a turnaround and caught us by surprise, caught the coaches on the sidelines for Northeast, and especially up in the booth, the onside kick. This is a call of the year. I don't think I've ever seen in all my years watching football team up 10 late in the game that's going to try an onside kick. It's a nervy call. And you know what? I don't love it. But when it works, as I said, I like it. And I think this is obviously to get the last touchdown here. Uh, I think you saw in the second half, at least in the fourth quarter, a tired Northeast team. You saw a lot of arm tackling. You saw them kind of fumble away the kickoff and then the onside kick. Last week, CCC basically wrapping up a district title. Tonight, you see Seminole win the district title. They are the only remaining unbeaten team in Pinellas County. Next week, we will not have two unbeatens, but we will have a barn burner as well in the 5A District 6. It is Chamberlain and Hillsboro last year. This game went four overtimes. Tonight, we probably were here for maybe two hours and 15 minutes. It will be a much different scenario next week. Please join us then. TWTV 47-style Friday Night Football right here. For Sandy Pinner, I'm Eric Keaton. Congratulations to Seminole and Northeast. An outstanding ball game. The Warhawks win it and the district title 23-7. For Kimberly Klinsky, our producer tonight, Scott Epstein, and our director, Ed Bacher, we'll see you next week.